Good morning. Welcome to the 23rd Eurodes webinar. This webinar is dealing with the European Intercomparation of In Vivo Monitoring Laboratories, the AVIC 2020 project. The agenda for today will be a short introduction about Eurados and Working Group 7 on Internal Dosimetry, then a summary of the AVIC project by DJ Frank, then the Production of Sources Quality Assurance and Measurement campaign from Oliver Meisenberg, and finally, the analysis of the results of the intercomparation and lesson learned. Please, for the questions, you can use up on the right the Q&A folder to put there all your questions during the, the webinar. The discussion will take place at the end. So I start with a short summary about UDATOS. UDATOS is the European Radiation Dosimetry Group, consists essentially in the General Assembly with 83 voting member institutions from 32 countries and more than 650 associate member scientists. The UDATOS board consists in the chair, vice chair, secretary and treasurer, currently the, the Chair is Philip Van Havere from SIKSM Belgium. Then is uh, the Eurados Council consisting in 12 members. And just to say that um, Eurados is member of the MINAS Association for the Coordination of Research for Radiological Protection in Europe with other platforms, Melody, um, involving in effects. Eurados Dosimetry, Euramed in Medicine, NEDIS in Emergency, Alliance in Radiocology, and Sharing Social Science. The main event of Eurados is the annual meeting. You can see in the slide the evolution of the different uh, annual meetings. La last time occurred in Porto in this year with 344 participants. Regarding science, the Eurados activity, we organize regularly the Eurados schools associated with the annual meeting, webinar series like uh, this one, Eurados training courses, symposia and workshop. An important part of the Eurados program are the intercomparation as well as report and publication. We have a Eurados website and also social media and Facebook X, uh, LinkedIn, and, and YouTube channel. Eight Eurados working groups are at the moment operative, uh, dealing with the uh, harmonization of individual monitoring, environmental dosimetry, computational dosimetry, internal dosimetry, dosimetry in radiotherapy, retrospective dosimetry, high energy radiation fields, dosimetry medical imaging, dosimetry and nuclear medicine. And also important to say that Eurados developed the Eurados Strategic Research Agenda, which second version was published as Eurados, Eurados report in 2020 and is available in the Eurados website. And to finish, just a few words about Eurados Working Group 7. Eurados Working Group 7 is dealing with internal dosimetries, chaired by David Brogio from IRSN France. And currently, apart from the EV project, they have different task group dealing with the implementation of ICRP OIR models on occupational intake of radionuclides, the internal dosimetry of therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals, the CADORMED 3, a tool for occupational internal dosimetry, intercomparison on internal dosimetry IC dose, internal dosimetry for emergency, and the intercomparison of whole body control for the monitoring of children. So the webinar today is, um, is part of the Working Group 7 program, and we will start now with the, with the first speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Didier Frank, is the deputy head of the research dosimetry department of the Nuclear Safety and Radiation Protection Institute at IRS in France. And he's also co-director of the doctoral school of nuclear physics at Paris-Saclay University. So uh, Didier, you got the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for this uh, introduction. 
So, uh, what my presentation will speak on the an overview of what was done, of what is the EVIC project. And uh, I will speak on three points, the background of this project, where uh, we and why we made this project, the objective and the principal task we uh, did during this project, and uh, the organization put in place. So, first of all, uh, just a little bit uh, of history about the of the project. Maybe uh, you might know that in uh, uh, 2018 there was a publication by the European Community of its radiation protection series, technical recommendation for monitoring individuals for occupational intakes of radionuclides. Uh, this uh, this uh, report, this guidance, uh, gave two uh, different information and different recommendations, especially for uh, those assessments in vivo monitoring and quality insurance. And a uh, three point could be uh, pointed out. The first one is that in vivo monitoring techniques are one of the methods used to monitor and assess possible intakes of radionuclides at workplace within a monitoring program. The second one is that wall body counter as an initial part of emergency preparedness and response plan. And the third one for quality insurance of the measurement result, it's essential that the laboratories performing wall body counting regularly participate in suitable inter-laboratory comparison. So from this point, uh, this, uh, uh, this guidance, uh, AC decide to uh, send a call uh, with the objective, two objectives. The first one is to assess the implementation of individual monitoring requirement in uh, European uh, member states based on in vivo measurement. And the second one, to receive an overview of the performance of in vivo measurement using whole body counters. Uh, from this uh, objective, given the experience uh, uh, of the Eurados group, as explained Maria before, it was decided to apply to this, uh, uh, to this uh, call. Uh, with the collaboration of BFS and IRSA. And uh, the acceptation of this project was in uh, uh, 2019. So uh, from this point, the specific uh, features of this project was a duration of two years, of course, because of the COVID crisis, it was uh, obsolete, so uh, we'll finish, we'll see a little bit uh, later on, a little bit later, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2000, 2022. And, of course, to organize an interlaboratory comparison of all body counting, as answering an appropriate general geographical coverage in the uh, European community, and beyond. That means that at least one lab per uh, AC member state will try to participate to this center comparison and uh, could be extended for some countries. And also, what we say, open also to labs for other European countries. Another point is that because we need to have an overview of the de technical uh, characteristics of laboratories, we developed a technical database of participating wall body counter, including general information and technical characteristics of the in vivo facilities in Europe. And the last point, of course, it was to organize uh, with uh, a participant a workshop to present results and especially action experience uh, of the work 
done in one body counting. Next slide. So what, is, what was the organization of this, uh, of the project? We organized a different work package. The first one is the project management. I don't want to speak about that. But there are three very important work packages. The first one was the interaction of stakeholder and participant. Of course, uh, we'll see a little bit later on, but this is very important to uh, select the laboratory participating to the intercomparison. The work package two, we devise and three sub work package will be more the uh, re realization of the uh, work of the intercomparison. So it will be the production of source, the measurement campaigns, and also, of course, the analysis of results. And the last one, of course, will be uh, the, uh, what we say, the participant workshop organization, and also the reporting of the result to participant And to the, so, uh, yes, uh, we uh, constitute a team. Uh, so I will present these, uh, these people. I think Tiffany Beaumont will speak, we'll see a little bit later on about the results and the, the analysis of, uh, of, the, of, of the results. Werner Buchholz from BFS was uh, more in charge of the uh, the circuit organization, myself, uh, Kerstin will be, was very important part of the work about administrative, administrative stuff. So uh, uh, you have also Marie, Maria Lopez, who, were, who was in charge of the work package one. So all the contact with laboratories and also part of the work package three about the communication. Oliver uh, Messenberg from BFS, we present just for me all the uh, technical uh, realization of source and phantoms. So it was the deputy project leader of this project. Two very important person from Eurados and for CMAT will be uh, as a scientific associate and work with us about all the work package. And uh, Philippe Van Verne will be the European chairman and will support our work uh, for in the uh, Eurados uh, structure. So I will now give you the principal task of these different work package. So, the first one is interaction with stakeholder and participant. Three uh, important points. First was the establishment of contacts uh, and with stakeholder and European laboratory. Uh, the second one was the constitution of list of participants and sending of official letters to participants. And the last one, which is uh, uh, quite important because during the, uh, uh, the work, we organize uh, virtual meetings to have the feedback of laboratories about what they think about the organization. So here is the list of participants. I'm not going to go through the, all the participants. Just to say that we had uh, 35 laboratories uh, in 20 countries and two uh, and European Commission IEA uh, were officially registered. Uh, two uh, several labs conduct measurements with more than one wall body counting. So that 41 results were received for this intercomparison. And you see on the map all the uh, country and the position of labs in Europe. You, you see that we uh, have quite a, 
good map and good uh, uh, yes ID of all Wolverine counting in Europe. The second one, production of source and phantom. Uh, the objective was to simulate measurements that are relevant for the computational monitoring programs of an individual exposed to intakes of gamma emitter at the workplace. You, Oliver will explain that uh, after me, but we organize, uh, we decide to uh, define four measurement tasks uh, with a brick phantom you see on the, on the pictures. Uh, and, uh, of course, from these different tasks, uh, there were, uh, at the, this site was to produce and qualify the source of, uh, at BFS. So, what were these tasks? And, uh, so there were four tasks. The task one, uh, which composed on three radionuclides, cobalt, barium, and cesium. Uh, and a phantom size uh, uh, 70 kilograms. We call that Victor because it's source coming from uh, IRSN, but it's quite radionuclide frequently used. Uh, and uh, I think the, must be the most easiest, uh, the easiest task uh, for uh, this enterprise. There is no interference, for example, between different radionuclides. The task two, we call that emergency, and it was made by the Phantom 90 kilogram. It was uh, if, uh, composed by cesium-134 and cesium-137. Cesium it's uh, relevant uh, for the monitoring of members of the population after the nuclear accident. Uh, it was quite easy task. Uh, except that for sodium neonide, it was a little bit tricky because you have interference between uh, different uh, uh, energy peak. So it was really, it was interesting to see how work this laboratory. The task three. So this one is maybe, I mean, I, it was the more difficult task because. Uh, it features uh, some radionuclides which are not used very often in laboratory. Uh, and another point, uh, important point, is that because it shots uh, short live uh, radionuclides, we could not send only one set to all laboratory. So it was organized in two tasks. That's 3.1 and 3.2. Uh, it was quite difficult, especially, we'll speak a little bit about that uh, afterward, but uh, to handle as well uh, because of uh, uh, the difficulty and the complex uh, way to organize the circuit. And the last one is the task four, uh, barium and europium. And it was organized with the phantom P4 and P5, and we called it like calibration. And uh, it was very useful. Uh, it used, of course, a large number of gamma ray emission. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, even it's difficult to use with sodium neodide detector, but it could be used afterward for the calibration of. Uh, facilities using germanium detector. The last point I want to, to say is that all these tasks, doing all measurement tasks, the phantoms were also prepared with uh, potassium-40 rods in order to simulate the natural radiation background of your body. The, okay, the next part of the, uh, the technical uh, work was, of course, the measurement campaign. Uh, and uh, it was organized either by shipment or by attendant transport. Uh, you see in red, 
the labs uh, where the measurements were made by attendant transfer. That means that there was Werner with a car going through all these laboratories. And uh, in blue, the uh, laboratory where the phantom was sent. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, uh, we went quite very far for some laboratories, but we didn't have any problem for this part. The last uh, part of the technical point is, of course, the uh, co collection analysis of results. So three points, collection of technical information on results. What I said before, uh, the data were uh, collected and provide a participant laboratory and a special uh, files in a, uh, in a cloud uh, made by BFS. The second one was the uh, development of a technical database uh, where all information, all technical information were registered. And the last one, which She is quite uh, in the thesis of uh, result uh, according to uh, ISO standard uh, for this work. To finish, I will say that, of course, it was a major part of the last, uh, last year, I would say, the reporting and dissemination. So uh, there were several points. Uh, which uh, has been made, reporting project statut to EC, so inception report, internal report, final report, uh, organization of a participant workshop, so made at uh, Madrid, uh, CIEMAT uh, in June uh, 2022, uh, and a webinar today, a webinar uh, organized by Euratoms. Uh, there was also a very interesting meeting uh, made with the expert group of Article 31 in Luxembourg in November uh, 2023. And also, uh, we are, uh, of course, publishing and communicate on the project. Uh, we have a publishable report, two publishable reports made, Eurados 1. So you have uh, the image here and you have the, the, the link if you want to uh, uh, upload, download it. And a re uh, radiation protection report will be, uh, I think, published very soon. And we've also, uh, of course, uh, we communicate in journal on conference. We had one in 2022 made by uh, Maria uh, ERPW. We have a publish, publication submitted uh, now, and uh, Tiffany Beaumont will make a presentation at IRPA in 2024. Okay, I finish. Uh, I don't know. I Thank you. Me. Thank you, Didier. Now it's time for the next speaker. This is Oliver Meisenberg. He's head of the Internal Monitoring Working Group at the Federal, Federal Office for the Radiation Protection, BFS, in Germany. His scientific focus is on the development of new methods in internal monitoring, the assessment of internal radiation exposure in the public, and in the preparation of radiological accidents. So, Oliver, it's your turn. Thank you, Maria, and a warm welcome also from my side to all who have joined today. At the beginning, let me shortly introduce to you what it means to use a phantom in a proficiency test for whole body counters. Uh, when we calibrate a whole body counter or test it in a proficiency, in, in a proficiency test, we apply so-called anthropomorphic phantoms. 
They resemble the shape and also relevant characteristics of the human body, and they can be equipped with a variety of radionuclides that are suitable for the respective task and different activities. On the photo on the left-hand side, you can see the phantom that we used in our proficiency test. This is the so-called brick phantom, which was developed about 25 years ago from colleagues from St. Petersburg, Koftun et al. And you can read some details about the phantom in the publication that is mentioned below. And this phantom can be equipped with rod-shaped radionuclide sources, as you can see them in the two images on the right-hand side. They are sealed sources of radionuclides with a specific activity and can also be produced in the lab uh, by yourselves. And as you can see later, we also produced some of these sources specifically for our intercomparison exercise. Now, having said this, I think this gives you a good, um, a good uh, idea what uh, what metro methodology we applied in our uh, proficiency test. And now let me give you some more details about the radionuclides that we decided for in the different tasks. Didier already uh, introduced the different tasks to you. Task one, the task called Victor, because this is the name of the phantom that is used at IRSN. This task featured the three radionuclides barium-133, cesium-137, and cobalt-60. This can be considered as a standard task uh, that was rather easy to be solved by the participants. Um, you can see here spectra that were simulated on the Nucleonica web portal on the left-hand side for high-purity germanium detectors with their excellent resolution, and on the right-hand side for sodium iodide detectors. Both types of detectors uh, are frequently encountered in whole body counters and also in our proficiency test. Um, and you can see that for both types of detectors, the three radionuclides can be distinguished very clearly Although for the barium-133, when measured with sodium iodide detectors, not all separate uh, emissions can be measured separately. You can see that even the barium-133 can be evaluated undisturbed from the other two nuclides. So this task was easy to be solved by participants with either of the two types of detectors. Task two, the task called emergency, featuring the two important isotopes of cesium, cesium-134 and cesium-137. You can see here in the spectrum for high-purity germanium detectors that cesium-137 features one gamma emission. Uh, by the way, the numbers next to the nuclide name uh, is the energy in kilo electron volts, and the cesium-137 4 features several emissions of gamma radiation. With high-purity germanium detectors, the different emissions can be distinguished very easily. However, this is different for sodium iodide detectors. Um, you can see in the middle of the spectrum uh, peaks from cesium-134 that are undisturbed from the peak of cesium-137. However, there is also this combined peak here um, from two emissions, one from cesium-137 and one from cesium-134. And when you evaluate the activity of cesium-137, you need to apply this peak and correct it for the contribution from cesium-134. So this was an additional challenge for those participants that applied sodium iodide detectors. However, this with this two um, nuclides together in one phantom or in one measurement, this is a typ typical task because 
um, these nuclides can be encountered together also in persons when persons are measured after radiological accidents. Task three called Medzin, because one of the two nuclides, germanium-68, is a radionuclide that is used in nuclear medical diagnosis. In fact, these two nuclides, germanium-68 and germ-88, have nothing to do with each other. They were just put together into one phantom and one set of uh, rod-shaped sources by us for this proficiency test so that they can be measured together in one combined measurement. Uh, both radionuclides have different challenges for the participants. Germanium-68 has a strong emission at 511 keV. This is secondary annihilation radiation, which features a variety of peculiarities. One is that the peak at 511 keV is typically wider than the other gamma peaks, and this must be uh, taken into account when the activity is calculated from that peak. Additionally, this peak is not suitable for identifying the radionuclide because all positron emitters contribute to that peak. Um, when you see that peak, you know that there is a positron emitter, um, but you cannot identify it. You need to see the second very much weaker peak at 1077 keV to identify the nuclide correctly and also to calculate the activity of the nuclide correctly. And a third um, challenge here was that at 511 keV, a background must be subtracted because at that energy, uh, also in the background measurements, you will see a small contribution. The uh, challenge from yttrium-88 is its emission at high energy at 1,836 keV. Um, when you calibrate whole body counters, you usually apply two specific radionuclides, and they are barium-133 and europium-152. They cover the energy range up to 1,408 keV. Let me show this on the next slide. The green dots denote the emissions of these two radionuclides that are used for the calibration of whole body counters up to the energy of 1,408 keV and emission of europium-152. Now, how can you evaluate the activity um, at energies above that energy of europium-152. Calibration curves of gamma spectrometry, gamma spectrometry detectors typically show um, the shape that you can see here um, drawn in blue. A linear shape when um, the calibration is shown on a log-log scale. So you can easily extrapolate uh, to higher energies as it can be shown here. Um, and the red arrows denote the energies of the yttrium-88. One at 898 keV here. And this is easy to evaluate because it is very close to one of the calibration points of europium-152. But the other one, the high energy emission, is well beyond the highest um, calibration point of europium-152. So you need to apply the linear extrapolation on the double logarithmic scale when you want to calculate the efficiency um, at that high energy. And we wanted to find out if, if, this is, if this is done properly. And therefore, we asked the participants not only to report a result for yttrium-88 as the radionuclide, but also separately for the two separate emissions, because we wanted to know if the activity is also calculated correctly from that high energy emission alone. 
And now task four, the calibration task, uh, featuring the two radionuclides barium-133 and europium-152. Um, in this task, we firstly wanted to know what activity uh, was found by the participants, but we also offered the participants to measure the phantom with these two nuclides for a longer time overnight, because as I mentioned before, these nuclides are the typical nuclides for a calibration of whole body counters. And therefore, the uh, participants were able to conduct another calibration of their uh, whole body counters. Let me call this a harmonized calibration uh, based on the results of our proficiency test. However, this task is suitable only for high purity germanium detectors because of the high number of emissions, as can be seen in the two spectra, um, with sodium iodide detectors, you won't be able to conduct or to, to evaluate um, these emissions separately. Now, having given you more details about the measurement tasks, I would like to come back to the phantom and the sources. Um, and the first question is, why have we decided to apply exactly this phantom, the St. Petersburg brick phantom? Um, this was because it features two advantages for us. One is the versatility. Um, the participants of our proficiency tests um, have whole body counters with a variety of different ge geometries. Not only chair, not only uh, not only stretchers, but also chairs, as you can see on the right hand side, inclined chairs in the top left image, and also this yeah, maybe rather uncomfortable uh, geometry where a person lies down on this uh, smaller stretcher with the feet facing down. Uh, this is a picture from a mobile whole body counter. Uh, that is used for emergency response. So we needed to be able to erect the phantom in a variety of different uh, geometries and positions. And this is possible with the brick phantom as can be seen here. The other advantage is that this type of phantom um, is equipped with sealed radioactive sources as compared to other types of phantoms, such as the bottle phantom. In the bottle phantom, the radionuclides are dissolved in a liquid. Here in this type of phantom, we apply sealed sources, which are more robust, which can also be handled in laboratories that are permi permitted to handle only sealed sources. This is a typical case because when you do not need unsealed sources, you probably will only have permission to handle sealed sources. And when handling sealed sources, no contamination is possible and no contam contamination checks need to be conducted after handling the sources and the phantom. However, as I will uh, explain to you in the next slides, we uh, prepared some of the sources ourselves in our laboratory. Therefore, we needed to test the sources according to the international standard 2919 to classify them as sealed radioactive sources. There are different classes and differently challenging tests for the sources depending on the activity and depending on the usage of the sources. And um, when you want to use low activity calibration sources, there is a very, say, low or uh, not so much challenging uh, set of tests that need to apply it according to class two as stipulated in this uh, international standard. The set of tests um, comprises an impact test where a weight of at least 50 grams uh, falls from a height of one meter down to the source and afterwards um, a contamination check of the source must be conducted to 
um, to prove that the sample is still intact and that no um, radioactive content is leaked from the source. Then a puncture test where a weight of one gram must fall from a height of one meter. Now, not with a flat bottom, with a, but with a pointed bottom with a diameter of only three millimeters. Two types of temperature tests, a low temperature test at minus 40 degrees centigrade or below for 20 minutes and a high temperature test for plus 80 degrees centigrade for 60 minutes. A low pressure test at 25 kilopascals, which is one fourth of atmospheric pressure and a bending test where a weight of at least 10.2 kilos acts on the middle of the rod source. On this slide, there are a few impressions from these tests. In the left image, um, a photo of the setup of the impact and the puncture test. This here is the rod source. This is the weight with the flat bottom for the impact test at the bottom and the pointed um, end at the top. So for the puncture test, it must be uh, used upside down. And we let it fall onto the source from a height of one meter uh, guided by these three metal bars so that it uh, hit the uh, source exactly in the middle. Of course, this weight is much heavier than one gram as it is required for the puncture test. But as I mentioned, uh, these are only the minimum requirements um, which can also be exceeded in the test. In the middle, a photo of the low temperature test which was conducted with dry ice well below the temperature that was required at minus, degree, minus 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, all of these tests, except of the bending test, were passed easily by our very robust sources. The bending test was most challenging. In the bending test, it is required that the source, which is this one, rests on two metal bars, metal cylinders. One is shown here. The other one at the rear side cannot be seen on this photo. And there is a heavier or um, a cylinder, a third cylinder with bigger diameter, which is this one. And this was pulled down by a weight of at least 10.2 kilos down and acts on the middle of the rod source. And we found out that our rod sources uh, break at a weight of about 15 kilos, so not so much more than the 10.2 kilos that are required in the bending test. However, this test was also passed. And therefore, we qualified the sources as sealed radioactive sources. Sources for task one were taken from the stock of IRSN. However, the other sources for the other three tasks needed to be produced in the lab of the Federal Office for Radiation Protection, DFS. And um, how did we produce them? We applied a method that we learned from colleagues of us from Switzerland. You can read about the method, how to produce such sources yourselves in this uh, publication. And uh, the sources are produced by filling a tube of PVC with a radioactive filling made of epoxy resin, which then hardens inside the PVC tube. Um, the epoxy resin is blended with a radionuclide solution and then filled as a liquid into uh, the tubes where it is left for hardening, uh, which takes about one day per source. Um, we can determine the activity of, of each single source from the net weight of the radionuclide solution that we put into each single source. We can also measure the activity from gamma spectroscopy measurements of single sources on a standard gamma spectroscopy detector. And we can also determine the activity of entire phantoms equipped 
with a set of sources from uh, measurements of the entire phantoms. However, all of these three methods um, feature problems. When you determine the activity from the net weight, you need to weigh masses of the radionuclide solution in the order of magnitude of a few 10 micrograms. And this is quite challenging. And in fact, there is not only one measurement, one weighing required per rod source, but five weighings because you put the radionuclide solution into the epoxy resin, then some amount of the epoxy resin stays into that laboratory vessel where you conduct the blending. And then you need to weigh also the remaining amount. And there are three other weighings and you need to calculate the activity, which is then, um, or which features then a quite significant uncertainty. In gamma spectroscopy measurements of single sources, there is the problem of true coincidence summing. When you want to measure sources, that feature several, more than one gamma emission. Um, this might be subject to true coincidence summing, um, which affects the activity that um, can be calculated from the gamma spectra. And the third problem with the, with the measurement of the phantoms, entire phantoms, was the typical problem when measuring a phantom that might be different from the phantom that you applied in the calibration of your whole body counter. And therefore, you also have um, uncertainty in the result of these measurements. And unfortunately, um, we observe differences of up to 10% of the activity that we calculated from the three methods. This is a pity because this was an obstacle for us to um, determine a certain reference activity for the sets of samples. Therefore, we decided to apply the robust mean of the reference activity. Just one example here on uh, this slide for one nuclide in one of the set of sources for one task. Um, here in this diagram, you can see each single dot denotes one source a uh, rod source for this set of sources. And on the right hand side, the activity that was calculated from the mass of radionuclide solution and to the top, the activity that was um, calculated from the gamma spectroscopy measurements. You see a correlation between the two results. In a perfect result, all of the uh, dots would be on this diagonal line because then the activity from the two methods would be the same for each source. However, you can see that the, so that the uh, points gather here on the left-hand side, meaning that the activity based on the mass of solution was smaller than that based on the measurement. 65.6% .6 based on the mass of radionuclide solution and 68.2% based on the gamma spectroscopy measurements. Here again, of a, a map of the location of the participants, because now I would like to give you uh, some short information about the conduction of and organization of the proficiency test and the shipment uh, of the phantom to the participants. You can see that the participants in the middle of Europe were served in an attended tour where the phantom and the sources were brought to the participants by a colleague of mine, Werner Buchholz, who is very experienced in conducting um, proficiency tests in an attended tour. He was there with the participants in their laboratories and helped them to set up the phantom in their whole body counters. The blue dots denote uh, the location of participants at more remote places and they were served by shipment. For the shipment, um, we uh, contracted DHL, a major shipment agency, and this, in fact, was very reliable. We used the web portal of DHA 
DHL and could set up the pickup and delivery of the phantoms um, exactly to the day, also at short notice. Uh, however, as you can see here, uh, shipment took much longer than the attended transport. In the attended transport, um, you can serve one lap in every next day, uh, because when you leave um, a lab in the morning, after the conduction of the measurements, um, you uh, will be able to arrive at the next laboratory at the same day or when the distance is um, longer than at least at the next day. For the shipment, um, you need several days until the Phantom arrives at the next laboratory. As you can see on the map on the right-hand side here, the participants outside the European Union were served by attended transport. Um, this uh, is relevant for Norway, United Kingdom, and Switzerland in our proficiency test. This is because it was much easier for us to serve them by attended transport and um, as compared to shipment because we were able to use a so-called ATA carnet, the so-called passport for goods. This can only be used in attended transport and it helps at the customs clearance because you can pass uh, the border to the countries for temporary import into these countries um, without um, long customs clearance. For the shipment, it was required to provide the participants with detailed instructions about the setup. Uh, we provided them with instructions as a written manual, with photos, sketches, and also with videos that were produced at CMAT in Spain. However, um, despite these de detailed instructions, mit mistakes can occur and in fact, or indeed, they occurred in our proficiency test. In task number three, the medicine task, we applied short-lived radionuclides, and therefore we applied two separate set of sources, uh, one for the first half of the intercomparison and one for the second half. They were exchanged in the middle. Um, however, unfortunately, as it seems, we were not so clear which set of source and when to change from set number one to set number two. And we observed, unfortunately, that very few labs, I think there were three labs, um, conducted the measurements with a different set of sources than what we expected. And unfortunately, we found that out only when we evaluated the results. Yeah, that's all what I wanted to show you about the preparation of the sources and the conduction of the a proficiency test, and now I would like to hand back to Maria uh, for the introduction of the next speaker. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much. Now it's, uh, it's time for Tiffany Beaumont. Tiffany is a researcher in internal dosimetry of the Internal uh, Dose Assessment Laboratory at IRSN in France. Her scientific focus also on development of methods for monitoring people following accidental and deliberate releases of radioactivity to the environment, in particular for children and persons of reduced mobility. So, Tiffany, it's your turn. Thank you, Maria, for this introduction. So I'm going to present you the analysis of the results of the HEVIC uh, intercomparison. The objective of the work package 2.3 were to develop a specific template um, to collect uh, results, to ensure the collecting and checking data of participants, to perform statistic analysis of results according to the international standard. That is, was to sum up the conformity and performance of the European facilities for in vivo monitoring. 
has DJ and Oliver say in the EVIC intercomba region, measurement had carried out on 41 facility from 35 laboratory and 21 country. There were five configurations covering the range of such possible measurement associated to different intake scenario called task one Victor with a P5 phantom, task two emergency with a P4 phantom, task three medicine with a P5 phantom, and finally the task four calibration with a P4 and P5 phantoms. The date of the beginning of the analysis, it's uh, May 1st, 2022. It corresponds to the receipt of the last test result. So first I'm going to present you the process of data evaluation. For the data collection, a specific template has been developed to collect measurement result and we download on the BFS cloud the result file of participant to limit the input error and to reduce the check circuit composed to Werner from BFS, DJ and I from IOSN, we use a link between the download template on the cloud and the IOSN analysis template. For the data evaluation, we use the ProLab software. It allows to perform proficiency tests according to international standards. It's the ISO 13528 and ISO 28218 for the inter-laboratory comparison. The first step is to determine the hashing value and according to the ISO 13528, there are many options. As example, you can use the reference uh, value of the certificate, but as Oliver explained to you, we cannot use this method. We can use also the consensus value from expert laboratory. As we can see here, the measurement were performed only by three experts. It's um, BFS, KIT, CMAT, and HIWASN. In addition, for the task uh, three, um, due to the short half-life of the radionuclide, only one expert performs the measurement, CMAT. So to ensure the homogeneous analysis, we cannot use this method. With the HEVIC team, we decided to use the consensus value from participants determined with the robust method because there are a lot of data from 41 laboratories. It's a reliable method and no additional measurements are required to obtain the async value. And this method was used to guarantee an homogeneous analysis between the tasks. As we can see here, for the cesium-137, the value of the robust mean here is very close to the mean of the expert laboratory here. For the data evaluation, the second step is to determine the bias with the following uh, formula according to the ISO 28218. And to be in conformity, the value should be between minus, minus 25 and plus 50% relative to the hashing value. Here, we can see the graphical representation of the bias. The research of outlier was performed using the GRUB um, test. And the third step is to determine the Z-score according to the ISO 13528. It's an indicator of the laboratory proficiency compared to that to the other laboratory. As we can see here uh, on this example, there are three criteria and the graphical representation of the Z-score. The Z-score depends directly on the dispersion of the result from the laboratory. By 
a lack of time. I cannot present you all results. So no, I'm going to present you only the result of the task two called emergency and more precisely for the cesium 137. This task, emergency, is also detailed in the first article of the EVIC project. As Didier said, all tasks are detailed in the Eurados report and European Radiation Protection report. The same analysis was performed for each radionuclide and each task. Regarding the raw data of the participants for the cesium-137, the graph shows the activity of the reporting result in blue in function of the number of facilities. The red line represents the limit, minus 25 and plus 50. The black line represents the hashing value. It's determined using the Humpel statistic method, and there are 40 facility reporting results. The distribution of the data is very close to the hashing value, and only three results are over the limit here and here. There is 7.9% of difference between the reference value and the robust mean of the participant. It's acceptable. The second step for the data evaluation is to determine the bias according to the ISO 28218. The graph shows the bias in person and in blue in function of the number of facilities. The black line represents the limits. There are three facilities in non-conformity according to the ISO, and the other results are conform, and we can show there are many facilities as close as possible to the target. The table here sum up the bias value for the facility in non-conformity. The third step for the data evaluation is to determine the Z-score according to the ISO 13528. The graph shows the facility ID in function of the Z-score for each radionuclide. If your results are in blue, it's considered acceptable. If it's yellow, it gives a warning signal. And if it's red, the value indicates in this graph, and it's unacceptable and give an action signal. To summarize, for the cesium-137, there are 35 facility acceptable, one facility give a warning signal, and four facility unacceptable give an action signal. The conclusion of the result can be summarized by the compliance report according to the standards. Depending on the normative reference applied, a difference in conformity exists for several installations. Several reasons can explain this difference. The tolerance interval are more restrictive according to the ISO 13528 than to ISO 28218. But, for example, the measurement not carried out under equal condition and with equal installation in terms of detection system, sodium iodine or germanium detector, type of participation, type of calibration phantom, type of calibration curve with 70 kg or not, in terms of measurement geometry, with sitting, lying, or standing position, the duration of the measurement, and the detector subject distance. That's why statistical tests regarding influencing parameters were performed using air software. The following tests were conduct main Whitney U test to compare the central tendency of the value, the Segel Turkey test to compare the dispersion of the value. Data used are all reported Z score ex except outlier from all tasks. By a lack of time, I just present you briefly the influence of the type of calibration phantom and the calibration curve. 
So, a phantom of 90 kilogram was used for emergency tasks. To calibrate the whole body counter, several laboratories used a 70 kilogram calibration curve applied systematically for measuring people and phantom. And others use an adapted calibration curve applied for measuring. As we can see on the box plot, the Z score with the 70 kilogram curve are significantly smaller than the Z score with the 19 kilogram calibration curve. The calibration curve influences the measurement. Regarding the influence of the type of calibration phantom, several phantoms are used. The brake phantom, bottle phantom, Canberra phantom, and horn phantom. As we can see on the box plot, the brake and the bottle phantom are similar, but we can see there are a big dispersion of results due to the overestimation of results from laboratory using the brake phantom. With the Canberra phantom, this tend to be underestimated, and with the horn phantom, tend to be overestimated. Before to conclude, the, there are an erat erratum for the task three called medicine. As DJ and Oliver explained, there was an error misunderstanding during the circuit. There are four labs impacted, the lab three, six, 10, and 17. And this lab moved from task 3.1 to task 3.2. With heavy team, we decided to re-evaluate the robust mean and the result in terms of bias and Z-score evaluation for this task. Regarding the result of the task 3.1, the difference of async value is acceptable, 3.1% and 1.3% for yttrium and potassium. No, there are no modifications on the gallium async value. Nevertheless, the bias and the z-score value have just changed slightly for all facility expect for high D-Lab 32 for the potassium. It was acceptable with the previous analysis, and no, it gave a warning signal for potassium with this value of Z-score. For regarding the result of the task 3.2, the difference of async value is also acceptable, 0.5 and 3.6%. For the four facility, three, 6, 10, and 70. The results are now confirmed for bias and acceptable for Z-score evaluation for the, the analysis radionuclide. Nevertheless, the bias and the Z-score value have just slightly changed for all facility except for Heidi Lab 28, Heidi Lab 14, and Heidi Lab. 39. For the first lab, before with the previous analysis, it gave a warning signal and now it gave an action signal. For the Heidi Lab 14, before it gave a warning signal and now it is acceptable. And finally, for the Heidi Lab for, um, 39, before it was confirmed, and no, it's not confirmed for the bias evaluation. Publication and communication on the HEVIC project take account this modification. On the publishable report, RADOS or Radiation Protection Report, article and conference. The heratum of the participation certificate for this task will be sent next week. Now, to conclude about this project, the main objective 
was to assess the implementation of the individual monitoring requirement in European Union based on in vivo measurement and receive an overview of the capability and performance of the whole body counter in Europe. Measurement were carried out for 43 facilities from 35 laboratories and 21 countries. It represents a very important database of Europe, European laboratory. There was five exercises in one intercomparison campaign. In general, there is a height participation for the task one, 40 out of 41 facility for the cesium 137, for the task two, 40 facility out of 41 for the cesium 134, for the task of three, 17 out of 41 facility for the gallium. This task is more difficult because it is not classical radionuclide. For the task for A, there are um, 20 uh, out of 41 facility for Europium. It will be it can be explained because this task was dedicated to germanium detector and not mandatory. And finally, for the task for B, there are uh, 30 uh, out of 41 facility for Europium. It can be explained because this task was dedicated to germanium detector. The analysis of the result was carried out and the conformity report of the facility are given for each configuration according to the criteria of ISO 28218 and ISO 13528. In general, the results are quite good for bias and its score evaluation, and the most part of the facility are conformed according to the standards. The EVIC team could discuss with the laboratory in nonconformity to ident identify the source of error. Statistical tests were performed to test, to test if there had a significant influence of the measurement parameters. And surprisingly, the results are quite similar for all laboratories, except for the phantom size dependency, because size-dependent calibration factor should be used. Eratum of participation certificate for task three will be sent next week. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Tiffany. I think it's time for discussion. If all the speakers show up with the camera and the microphone. Thank you. So according with the chat, there are two participants who ask question to Oliver. Oliver, are you available? Yeah. Ah, uh, perfect. Yes. Can you yes. summarize first? Gabor Lafranco was interested in the activity calculated uh, by BFS. Can you summarize, please, the, the answer? Yeah, sure. So, um, as I mentioned, we measured the radionuclide sources on a gamma spectroscopy detector. Uh, in each single source, there is an um, activity of very few 10 becquerels. Um, therefore, we applied a high efficiency geometry with a small distance between detector and source. And this is influenced um, by true coincidence summing, which is a problem when you want to evaluate the activity. Um, as uh, Gabo Lafranco mentioned, there are ways to correct for this influence. Um, we try to do this. And by the way, um, some of the radionuclides inside our sources were also present inside the calibration standard for the gamma spectroscopy detector, yttrium-88 and cesium-134. When you do this, when you do such a nuclide-specific cal uh, calibration, there is no need to 
correct for true coincidence summing because you have the same effect in the calibration and in the measurement. However, the other radionuclides, such as the barium-133 and europium-152 in the calibration task number four, uh, were influenced by the true coincidence summing and they were not present in the uh, calibration standard of the detector. So we needed to correct for this influence. Uh, we tried to do so, but because of the strong influence of um, the summing effect and also because of the very specific geometry with that very th thin and long rod source that also protruded over the edge of the detector, it was difficult to correct for this effect. And mm. therefore, we still had these uncertainties or biases uh, between the different methods. Then there was also a suggestion uh, to calculate the mass of radionuclide solution that was put into an entire set of samples by simply measuring the weight or the mass of the radionuclide uh, solution at the beginning and at the end of the production. However, this is also not possible because of evaporation of the radionuclide solution and its solvent, which influences the specific activity of the um, of the radionuclide solution, um, producing a set of sources takes several weeks and you cannot be sure that the um, radionuclide solution is not influenced by this effect over that time. And also um, calculating the activity in the sources is a bit more difficult than just measuring the weight of the radionuclide solution just once because um, there are several steps in the production of the radionuclide source where you can lose radioactivity inside the laboratory vessels that you use for the blending of the solution and the epoxy resin and you must correct for that and therefore you need to measure the weight or mass of radionuclide solution for each single sample. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, I think there is a second comment from Bernardo Dantas regarding the Bobap Phantom. It's, it's not. Uh, did you read it, uh, no. Oliver? No. I oh, am. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Don't <laughs> Yes, um, I have read that there was such a question um, in the Q&A section, and I think oh. the question was um, about the characteristics of the Bomat bottle phantom as compared to the brick phantom. Um, several of our participants um, calibrated their whole body counter mm -hmm with the bottom up or other types of bottle phantoms. This was shown on one of the last slides that were presented by Tiffany Beaumont. Um, and there was a statist statistical evaluation. I don't know, can we go back to that slide? I don't know. I will just um, respond to that orally. Um, we found out that those participants uh, that calibrated their whole body counters with the BOMAP phantom um, showed very uh, similar results. Yeah, mm -hmm. This was in, no, not in my presentation, but in Tiffany's presentation. Uh, showed very similar results um, as compared to the participants that calibrated mm -hmm. their whole body counters with yeah, this one with uh, the brick phantom. Yeah. You can see that with other types of phantoms, there is a bias. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the thick, blue, uh, thick black line in the middle is the median result. Mm -hmm. And on the left -hand side, you can see the bias. It, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, we, yes, just to say that we, we observed the same, I think you, you did the same in your lab, uh, Oliver, but uh, 
uh, we organize uh, the comparison to, uh, in France and especially for the Canberra uh, Phantom, we have sell always these phenomena and for the others, it's quite uh, similar. So uh, it, co it corresponds what we found with other under comparison. But the Canberra uh, Phantom, yes, uh, the, uh, it's a little bit lower. Uh, I don't know because uh, I think the calculation, it's a source which is made in a special place to simulate uh, whole body uh, contamination. But anyway, even if it's a kind of simulation, I'm not sure that it was perfect. <laughs> okay. But the conclusion is if you calibrate with the Boba Phantom and you perform measurement with the Brick Phantom, your results can be perfectly right. Yeah. Isn't perfectly it? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is exactly. a good this is a good conclusion for all of us who yes. especially <laughs> those who calibrate using BOMA. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. It was a good conclusion of, of the project. It, oh. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think if there are no further questions, I think it's time for closing. Do you want to add any remarks, speakers? Just to say that in Eurados, yeah. we are planning uh, to study uh, the children monitoring uh, using Brick Phantom. There will be a, stu a study for the future yeah. and we'll perform within <laughs> Working Group 7 with exactly. the collaboration, of course, with the Tiffany, Oliver, and DTN, and CMAT. Yes. And you know that we are performing right now, it's more emergency uh, uh, work, but uh, uh, wood measurement as well, mm -hmm. uh, right now, and uh, it's almost finished, but I, will mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to speak about that, but of course, measurement in vivo monitoring needs what I say at the beginning, but it's uh, of, of views that we need to to continue to make uh, inter comparison to to test uh, the homogeneity of the result and the way that people are working. Just to finish, it's sure, and then Maria and Oliver will, and uh, Tiffany will say uh, that uh, the workshop was also very uh, success. We had more than 70 party, uh, people <laughs> participating, and the exchange was very fruitful uh, about experience, but also to know, to exchange about some problem we could uh, occur in the measurement. So it's a very, very, very interesting uh, work to be uh, continue. Mm -hmm. Oliver, <laughs> if you have any other things to say, Oliver? No? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. But I think you, <laughs> you have so, already talked about the current most important um, tasks in Eurodos Working Group 7, yeah. future tasks yeah. that um, are conducted now and in the next years. So that's fine for me. Mm -hmm. And, and just so I want to uh, uh, to say thank you also to even uh, uh, she doesn't want uh, I mentioned that but uh, Kirstine yeah. for the great work done uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the the different uh, task I mean the other especially with all the problems we got by the pandemic and so on. To, to keep together. Hello, Kerstin. <laughs> Hello, Kerstin. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, you are those uh, because uh, it's the, also in the, in the frame of your adults that we can uh, work together. Didier, we have a last minute comment. It's a person from oh. in India that ah. uh, is interested in participating in the Bund exercise and also ah. in the <laughs> children monitoring. Oh. I'm sure that David is uh, is watching, so I'm sure we, you know, that we we plan to send the Phantom to Canada and then after to Japan. 
And then maybe why not have someone when he come back to think about India. So uh, we, okay, we not this point. And uh, uh, if she want to contact me and uh, David or, or, or Maria, I uh, will see uh, the possibility to, to stand. And Tiffany, because uh, Tiffany uh, is also very important to make the phantoms and so on. So why not? I would be happy. Uh, uh, maybe uh, not in a uh, short term, but maybe uh, uh, next year. Why not? Perfect. So thank you. And uh, I think we close the session. Thanks to the speakers and thanks to participants. Thank I think it was a very successful webinar. So okay. continue in the internal dosimetry field and sharing and disseminating yeah. as Eurados does. Okay. okay. See you. Thank you. See you. See you. See you. See you.